Good evening. Welcome to our forum this evening, a public information forum on the Fredonia water system. My name is Jim Hurtgen. I am a retired member of the Fredonia faculty. Tonight's panel uh, discussion is sponsored by the Chautauqua County Health Department and the Village of Fredonia. In a minute, I'll be introducing our panelists, but I want first to thank a few individuals who were instrumental in uh, forming this, this uh, panel discussion this evening, or those who have or are assisting in it. County Legislator Susan Parker, Jessica Worsley, our Director of Environmental Health. I will be introducing her more fully in a, in a moment. Natalie Whiteman, also of the Chautauqua County Health Department. Fredonia Mayor Mike Ferguson. Our friends and neighbors who serve on the Fredonia Board of Trustees. Michelle Twitchell. John Esperson. Nicole Syracuse. Paul Wandell. And Ben Brockler. Thank you all. Lastly, I want to thank uh, the staff of the Fredonia Opera House, our beautiful Fredonia Opera House, Rick Davis, Marcia Finley, and Dan Allen. Thank you all. Tonight's panelists, Jessica Worsley, who is on the far left, is Chautauqua County's uh, Director of Environmental Health in the history, uh, the, the, uh, I'm recalling my previous career, in the Health Department. She earned her bachelor's degree in interdisciplinary studies with a focus on environmental sciences from SUNY Fredonia and her master's degree in biology from Buffalo State University. Go Bengals! Additionally, she gained in, uh, invaluable public uh, health experience in the Gambia, West Africa, where she served as an agriculture and environment vo volunteer with the U.S. Peace Corps. Jessica began working at the health department in 2006, investigating beach water quality, identifying watershed concerns, and processing water samples. Throughout her years with the health department, she has worked in a variety of program areas. She has been the director of environmental health, the, the environmental health division for two years. To my left is Natalie Whiteman. Natalie is the senior water resource specialist for the Chautauqua County, County uh, County's uh, health department. Uh, in the Environmental Health Division. She earned a bachelor's degree in biology and a master of science degree in environmental pollution control, both from Penn State University. Go Nittany Lions! I guess there aren't a lot of people <laughs> who do that. Natalie has worked at the health department uh, for 23 years, in addition to her work as senior water resource specialist. She has also served in areas of public health uh, uh, emergency preparedness and childhood lead poisoning prevention efforts. Prior to working for the health department, Natalie managed a commercial environment lab, taught wastewater treatment operator classes, and operated two municipal groundwater treatment plants. On my immediate right is Dr. Courtney Wigdahl Perry. Courtney is the, an associate professor of biology at SUNY Fredonia. She earned her PhD in ecology and environmental sciences from the University of Maine in 2012. Go 
you don't know, black bears. <laughs> As an aquatic ecologist, Courtney's research program centers around understanding how lakes respond to environmental changes. She works on local lakes in western New York as well as other systems uh, around the world, primarily focusing on algae communities and water quality issues. Her research interests span different time scales using field sampling techniques and high-frequency sensors to study lakes today, as well as uh, studying biological uh, fo uh, fossils preserved within lake sediments to explore the past history of lakes. Uh, history means past, but this is really past. So that's why past history. Dr. Matthew Lan uh, Lanning joined the faculty at Fredonia in uh, the fall of 2022. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Geology and Environmental Sciences. Uh, he did his uh, graduate work at Indiana University. Go Hoosiers! Uh, he uh, focuses on, uh, uh, well, he is an uh, echo hydrologist specializing in how uh, ecosystems respond to environmental stresses like drought, acid, uh, deposition and climate change. So, uh, welcome to the panelists, and I, I think neglected to say welcome to all of you. Uh, how are we going to do this this evening? First, we'll have a presentation by members of the panel, which will include information about the Fredonia Reservoir, Fredonia's, uh, the Fredonia uh, Water Treatment Plant, and the role of Chautauqua County's Health Department uh, in, in the regulatory uh, process involving our water systems. Following this, we will uh, address, our panelists will address your questions. This is how it works. You're going to write a question uh, on an index card. I think they're being passed out or have been. Uh, and uh, they will make their way to the front, get organized, and, uh, and then uh, we will uh, see which among our panelists feels most comfortable in addressing them. Uh, I should say that uh, the pre presenters will not be able to address specific questions regarding recent votes taken by the Village of Fredonia's uh, board or the specific uh, finances ref referenced in the recent Labella engineering report. It is not their area of expertise nor of their research. Uh, uh, Involvement. So, uh, with that, I will turn the uh, program over to our panelists, and please do work on your questions. Good evening, everybody. Am I close enough to the microphone? Uh, so, so again, I'm Jessica Worsley, Director of Environmental Health for Chautauqua County. I'm very happy to see you folks coming out tonight and participating in this. We're, we're happy to be able to have a chance to hopefully address some concerns, clear up some information that folks may have been hearing in the, um, in the public. Well, I don't need to go over this because Jim did a wonderful job and has us all covered. So Chautauqua County Health Department uh, the mantra that we are living by these days is prevent, promote, and protect. That's our role at Chautauqua County. We are interested in preventing communicable disease. We are interested in promoting the reliable infrastructure and community awareness of public health issues, um, and in general, simply protecting public health. So that's our role, and that's why we're here today, to try to get this message across and share some good information. We'll walk through some issues related to the reservoir, some history of the reservoir, move over into the water treatment plant, talk about some water quality issues, um, and talk about you know, some potentials for the future, and specifically what our role as the County Health Department has been in this process thus far. So I'm going to start with something we can all agree on. The Fredonia Reservoir is a beautiful location. It's important to remember that that beautiful location was created by us. The reservoir is not a naturally occurring body of water. 
the start of the reservoir really happened in 1984, I'm sorry, 1884, when a group of then residents uh, created a small dam and a small reservoir with only about 10 million gallons of water in it. The reservoir is formed off of a small branch of Canada Way Creek. So the main branch of Canada Way Creek is the thicker line up there. That's the branch that, you know, when folks think of Arkwright Falls, Shumla Falls, that's that main branch of Canada Way Creek. The reservoir is not fed by that branch. The reservoir is fed by a smaller tributary branch of that creek. In 1938, the reservoir size increased dramatically. The village was growing. Uh, the residents recognized the need for public water supply, and a dam and spillway were built. They increased the reservoir volume to 332 million gallons. Where does the reservoir get that water? So again, we talked about the creek. The reservoir is filled with water from the watershed of that small creek. So a watershed is the area of land that water washes off of to fill in a body of water or a stream. The Fredonia Reservoir gets 99% of its water from the watershed. A small portion, 2%, one, sorry, 1% 1 falls from the sky directly onto the reservoir um, surface, you know, rain, snow falling directly onto the water, but the large majority of that water is coming from watershed runoff. So within the watershed, there are a few different types of land use. The large majority of land use within the watershed is forested and vacant land. The map that you see up here is color-coded by parcels, and the parcel use that is defined in the Chautauqua County GIS system. So the orange areas and those lighter orange areas, those are all forested and vacant lands. Vacant lands could include grassy areas, um, just undeveloped lands at this point. Agricultural areas are in green. They form the, they make up the second largest umbrella of land in the watershed. And there's also residential and commercial land in the watershed. Those three, the orange, the green, and the yellow, are all the different land uses within the watershed. Each of them include, each of them has the potential to affect the reservoir in different ways. So forested area is beautiful, it's forested, but it still contributes and affects the reservoir. Plant debris from the forested area gets carried to the streams, blows into the reservoir, accumulates in the reservoir, Sediment erodes from stream banks and um, you know, just general runoff within the watershed area, flows to the creek, ends up in the reservoir. Agriculture areas have that same, those same two potentials. They also carry the potential for fertilizer, pesticides, manure pathogens, and different things to also get washed into the reservoir. Commercial and residential areas, if nothing else, they have some sort of on-site wastewater treatment system or a septic system. We at the health department know of 22 permitted septic systems within the watershed. I guarantee you there are more than that because um, we always have unpermitted septic systems and those are the ones that we actually need to worry about because those are the ones that were not installed with the correct oversight to ensure that they're functioning correctly. And then there's all the other things that people do on land to um, contribute to water quality issues. So, you know, runoff that would include things like pesticides or fertilizers on residential lands, as well as you know, heavy metals from any of the, you know, materials that we use in our everyday lives. The last sort of tannish color there is representing roadways. There aren't a lot of roads in the watershed necessarily, but there is a large section of Route 60 that cuts through the watershed. Um, on road runoff would include salt that we use in the winter. It would also include things like all those leaky cars, oil, fluids leaking out of cars. When accidents happen, the fluids that are leaking out of cars and washing down, down the paved surfaces into the waterways. Uh, and then, again, because 
Route 60 is in the watershed and it is a major transportation route, you know, there is the potential for some kind of dangerous, um, dangerous material being transported over Route 60 and potentially influencing the reservoir. So now that we've talked a bit about the reservoir, let's talk about the size of the reservoir and compare it to some of the other reservoir watershed sizes in the county. So in Chautauqua County, there are three municipalities that receive their public water supply via a reservoir that is Fredonia, Westfield, and Ripley. The charts up here are intended to give you a better visual of the size of those individual watersheds compared to the population that they serve. So Fredonia Reservoir's watershed is about 5.7 square miles. And at its peak, when SUNY Fredonia is in session and everybody's in town, we're looking at about 15,000 people. You compare that with Westfield, whose watershed for the reservoir is significantly larger at 26.8 square miles. And that is only serving about 3,800 people. The size of the Ripley Reservoir watershed is very comparable to Fredonia's watershed. That serves 1,500 people. So that's just some information to give you an idea of the different types of reservoir systems that we have in the county and the populations that they serve. So let's actually talk about Fredonia Reservoir's capacity. The hashed line moving across the chart there represents that original 1938 capacity at 332 million gallons. In 1988, the village saw a need to increase the capacity of the reservoir. They increased the spill, the, they raised the spillway and the volume was increased to roughly 352 million gallons within the reservoir. But that's reservoir capacity. That's not the water that is available for Fredonia to actually use. The intakes from which Fredonia water treatment plants receives water from the reservoir or pulls water from the reservoir are not sitting in the deepest part of the reservoir. So they're not able to pull and access all of the capacity of the reservoir. So what we really need to talk about is the usable water that's in the reservoir. The dates up here, 1990, 1999, 2011, these correlate with engineering reports that the village commissioned and reported usable water volumes. So in 1990, 211 million gallons, 1999, 214 million gallons, 2011, 201 million gallons. The question we'd have is that we don't know what the current usable volume is. It's a question that we need to answer, and it's also a question um, that it's important to recognize, I'll, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I'll get to it in a minute why it's extra important. Um, it, you'll notice that that volume from the usable water from 1990 through to 2011 is decreasing. So why, why would that be happening? The problems with Fredonia Reservoir have to do with sedimentation. So when I talked about the watershed and runoff coming through the watershed to creeks and, fill and getting to water getting to the reservoir, the problem is that within that watershed, there are a lot of fine, silty soils. So as that water is running through the watershed, running off to the streams, it's bringing that fine, silty soil with it. So when you see the creeks look like chocolate milk, that's really turbid water. That's all that fine particulate matter all churned up and being poured down those water channels, which will eventually reach the reservoir. Once that churned up turbid water reaches the reservoir, the reservoir is nice and calm. It has a chance to settle. Those fine particulates start to fall out of the water suspension and fill in the reservoir. So the cylinders here are meant to give you the idea that as time has gone on, more and more sediment has filled in the reservoir, decreasing the amount of actual usable water that's available within the reservoir. So that brings us to a hot topic of dredging 
and why dredging is so important to sustain the reservoir. Dredging maintains that usable volume of water. You're gonna dredge and pull out that fine silt and sediment to be able to have more usable water available. Dredging also takes out that fine silt and sediment before it gets sucked into your water treatment plant and causes more problems. And it's important to think about how weather events affect sedimentation. Although I don't remember it, uh, 1972, Hurricane Agnes certainly dumped a lot of water very quickly in our neck of the woods up here in the Northeast. The estimated reports from the sedimentation that, that was caused by Hurricane Agnes reduced the reservoir volume by 40.4 million gallons. That's just sediment being transported out of the watershed and dumped into the reservoir. In 2011, the O'Brien Gear Engineering Report estimated that roughly 43% of the original usable volume of the reservoir was lost due to the, se the sedimentation process. So those are hard, it's hard numbers to really fathom and, and think about. So the sort of analogy that we have is 50,000 dump trucks full of soil dumped into the reservoir. And that was in 2011. So we're almost 12 years, 13 years later at this point. So what other damage has been done and what, how much additional sediment has been swashed into that reservoir. Now, Fredonia has been talking about dredging for a lot of years. There were plans to dredge in 1965, 1972, 1999, 2001. There were all plans, permits ready to go. Let's start dredging. None of it has ever happened. In 2001, an engineering report included plans and permits to dredge the reservoir once a year for 10 years to start to combat some of the sedimentation process. Again, none of it has happened. So the reservoir has continued to be filled in with sediment. So considering that the reservoir is filling in from the bottom, thinking about where the reservoir levels on the top are landing now and in the future. The way that the reservoir receives water is from snow and rain falling directly onto the reservoir surface or from snow and rain being washed down in the watershed to the reservoir. And now we're thinking about how the water then is taken, the usable water is taken out of the reservoir. So the water treatment plant pulls water out and there's evaporation. So if we don't have all of that good rain, good snow to be filling the reservoir, then those levels are dropping without being regenerated, which is why, per New York State regulation, the volume of usable water must be adequate to supply demand based on a one in 50 year drought event. Now, some of us have short-term memories. We don't necessarily remember what has happened in the past with the reservoir, but we have had drought events with the reservoir, years where the reservoir has been severely depleted. 1991, the reservoir was depleted by 95%. 1998 and 99 by 78%. 2007 by 60%. The pictures up here, the red circles, in this beautiful picture up in the corner here where the reservoir is nice and full, that's the intake structure. So as I mentioned earlier, the intake structure is not in the deepest part of the reservoir, which is part of the issue. But also you can see that in these drought years, there was no way that we were going to successfully be pulling water in, let alone water that wasn't full of sediment from the bottom into the water treatment plant. So in those, in those years, the village continued to operate. Where did they get water? They pulled water from Casadega Lakes. They received New York State DEC emergency permits, and they pulled water in from Casadega Lakes. 
in the permit that the DEC issued in 9899, the village was mandated to find an alternative source of water, not to completely abandon the reservoir, but to consider where are they going to supply water for the village in these times of drought. Casadega Lakes is an entirely different large watershed than the reservoir. The reservoir is in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence watershed. Casadega Lakes is actually in the Allegheny Mississippi watershed. And although it was granted as an emergency permit for those drought years, the federal government does not like combining large water systems, not to mention the potential issue of invasive species and contamination and those sorts of issues when we talk about combining water from different watersheds. So we don't know for sure what would happen in the future should Fredonia suffer a drought again and the reservoir have problems supplying the village. Because again, federal regulations have changed as far as being able to pull from different watersheds. Now, again, considering drought concerns, um, those of you, maybe, some of you may be celebrating the mild winter that we had, uh, but we did have a lot less snow this year than we have had in previous years. The snow pack in the winter is extra helpful because it builds up that precipitation in snow, and then as the snow melts, it allows it to gently fill the reservoir. We haven't had that this year. So we don't have that buffer of beautiful snow melt water that's melting nice and slowly and providing the reservoir. So, and we've also experienced other climate change issues, um, extreme weather events. So the concern for the future is making sure that there is enough water in that reservoir. So I'm gonna move away from reservoir issues and talk about the dam and the spillway. The dam and spillway are inspected by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, New York State DEC. The dam is classified as a class C or high hazard dam. That classification is based on what the potential failure of that dam would mean to the population in the Fredonia area. So because there is a large population, infrastructure, built infrastructure, built world that's downstream of that reservoir, that's why that classification is given to, to the dam. The dam is an earthen dam, so the core of that dam is clay material that is not very um, water malleable. It's pretty solid. Once you put it there, it should stay where it is pretty well. And then on the outside of that, cl uh, that clay area is the, um, the other soils that don't hold water as well and let water move through them better. Earthen dams have positives and negatives. The positives is they're certainly cheaper to build. Uh, the negatives is that they you know, are certainly not as structurally sound as a rock dam or a hard structure dam. In 1980, the dam was inspected by the DEC and deemed unsafe non-emergence. The spillway was also inspected and was deemed seriously inadequate. In 2017, the dam was again inspected by the DEC and again deemed unsound fair. The most recent inspection, 2023, the dam was again deemed unsound fair. I'm sharing these not as a means to try to excite anybody, but simple facts. There is an established pattern of the structure of that dam and the concern for its safety. The most recent DEC inspection did mention that the condition rating is due to the lack of spillway capacity and the inadequate structural stability of the dam and that the deficiencies are of such a nature that the safety of the dam cannot be assured. I will end with a slight positive. 
that they also added the dam is expected to perform adequately under normal loading conditions. The question, though, is what does loading look like for the future? So that's what we have to consider, is that the structural integrity of that dam, and is the future going to look like the past? So my reservoir summary, current volume of the usable reservoir water is unknown. The last estimate that we had in 2011 did not meet usable water requirements under New York State Department of Health regulations. The reservoir will need immediate dredging and future dredging should it continue to maintain the volume of water and the quality of water within the reservoir. An alternative connection was mandated by New York State DEC to be able to supply the village with water should another drought event happen. The dam and the spillway are going to have to be maintained so long as that reservoir exists. If the volume of water in the reservoir is drawn down, then the risk of that dam um, having a failure is reduced because you don't have as much water pushing on pressure on that dam and spillway. And finally, just this idea that the concerns about the dam and the reservoir are not new. The earliest documentation that we find with reports is 1965 people started talking about concerns for the long-term viability of the reservoir, the need for dredging, the need for maintenance. Lastly, I'm going to work on transitioning to Natalie here. Where does the water from that reservoir go? 64% of it flows right over the spillway and back into the creek. So it's not available to be used. 2% is lost to evaporation, 34% pulled into the water treatment plant. The safe yield of the reservoir in 2011 was estimated at 1.1 to 1.5 million gallons per day. Fredonia's current usage, average day, is 1.4 to 1.6 million gallons per day. So the question is, what is the safe yield today? It's probably not more than it was in 2011. So again, 34% of the water is going to the water treatment plant. I'm gonna pass the mic over to Natalie here and she will describe water treatment plant to you. So we're gonna discuss how the water gets treated by starting at the reservoir. Um, in Jessica's earlier pictures, you saw a picture of the intake structure. That intake structure actually holds two 12-inch lines, um, one at a shallower level and one at a deeper level, that allows water to flow by gravity to the water treatment plant. So they pass through the dam, follow the stream bed, and run down to the water treatment plant. Um, and, and as Jessica said, they are not in the deepest part of the reservoir. When they hit the treatment plant, there is what the treatment water operators call the coffin. Um, it is, picture a concrete box about the size of a two-drawer file cabinet that the water comes into. You have two pumps, or actually there's four pumps because you do have redundancy. Two pumps pumping polyaluminum chloride, two pumps pumping cation, uh, cationic polymer into the top of the tank. So it's literally just dripping into the top of this mixing tank. And you're adding bentonite clay as well. The purpose of those chemicals is to allow the fine, almost dust-like clay particles to clump together so that when they get to the upflow clarifiers, as that water flows upwards through that triangular clarifier, there's a sludge blanket in the bottom of the clarifier that acts as kind of like a strainer. It takes out the largest particles that are in the water. That creates some waste, which goes over to your backwash water and filter to waste tank, and creates also some partially treated drinking water. I want to point out in this slide, everything that is in brown or tan is not fully treated water. 
It's not fully treated until you're over here in the light blue. So at the clarifiers, we have partially treated water that then gets dumped onto the filters. Again, all that happens through gravity flow. Your filters contain anthracite and sand. I want to note that, yes, anthracite is a fancy word for coal. However, what is on your filters is not granular activated carbon. It is the equivalent of taking a charcoal briquette, crushing it up, and using it no different than you would sand. The only process, the only treatment that is providing it is just like a sieve. It's just filtering out the large particles. So the water goes down through the filters, comes out, you pump in trichloroisocyanurate for disinfection, that's your chlorine solution, and you add blended polyphosphate. The blended polyphosphate is because the water is corrosive. Once it's been treated, the water will, how do I explain this easily? The water will literally dissolve pipes after it's been treated. It is corrosive. It's not going to plate out hardness. It's not going to plate out iron. It will literally dissolve lead and copper, anything really but plastic pipes. And we'll talk a little more about that later. So from the filters, your water goes to the clear well which is the 300,000 gallon tank that's up on the hill that's gonna get cleaned next week. That water is not technically considered treated until it sits in the clear well for an appropriate length of time for the chlorine to act on it to kill any microorganisms that are in that water. So it is really not until the water leaves the clear well that it's considered treated. I'm gonna stop there a second and point out that you have two waste flows at your, waste, or at your drinking water treatment plant. One of them is that sludge that I talked about coming off the bottom of your clarifiers. So that's the really intensely dirty water that is created from those particles that come in with your drinking water. The second waste flow is actually off the bottom of your filters. Your filters are reusable because you backwash them you pump, you physically pump those black little circles with a T off of them, that's a typical engineering symbol for a pump. You pump water backwards from your clear well up through your filters to clean the filters. All of that dirty water then goes out to a big tank that is next to your clear well, where the solids settle out of it. The clean-ish water flows back into the creek. That requires a permit from the New York DEC. It's called a speedies permit. Um, it's a pollution discharge elimination permit. The solids off of the bottom of that tank then get sucked up with a vacuum trunk or truck and get carried down to your wastewater treatment plant to be treated there. So from the clear well, there are three lines that come out of the plant. The numbers in parentheses are the dates those lines were installed. So your largest line is a 24-inch line that goes directly to the tank on Webster Road, and there's, which was installed in 1980. And you have two 12-inch lines that literally run down the creek and come in through Leona and down into the village. One was built in 1883, and the other one was built in 1933. So the village essentially has three lines that feed it. The Webster Road tank, which is pumped to the village. The water from the tank on Webster Road does not flow to the village via gravity. The Webster Road tank is lower than the southern part of the village. It cannot feed the folks on Spoden Road. It cannot feed the folks on Boses, or could not if it didn't have a pump. So it does. It has a pump, so it can feed 100% of the village from the tank. Concerns that we identified at the water treatment plant the last time that we did an inspection. Um, the gentleman in the photo is Casey Miller, a coworker of mine. Um, Casey is about five foot six. There is less than four feet between the corner of that building and a 50 to 60 foot drop into the reservoir. Creek, sorry, ravine was the word I was searching for. 
behind that wall is 250,000 gallons of water in your clarifiers times 8.34 pounds per gallon, you've got more than a thousand tons of water sitting behind that wall, pushing on that little strip of land that's left between it and the ravine. Another concern that we've identified in this bottom picture, it's kind of hard to see, the pipe all the way on the left is actually light blue. This pipe all the way on the right is tan. The pipe on the left is your treated water coming off of your filters. The pipe on your right, the tan pipe, is the dirty backwash water. To be safe, there should be a backflow prevention device in there. You should have a RPZ, a reduced pressure zone device, or a double check valve. You don't have that, and it's been known for years that you don't have that. But one of the reasons is that, as you can see in this picture, there's no space. That tan pipe is the pipe that, or the kind of reddish orange pipe, is the pipe that feeds water to the filters. You've got an awful lot of equipment up on that hill that is crammed into a very small space. Um, another concern we identified is security of the facility, and that's really all I'm going to say about that. There's also a couple major concerns with your operator safety. Working with bentonite clay is kind of like working with glitter. Ever have your grandkid or your kid dump a thing of glitter and it just goes poof, it goes everywhere? That's what bentonite clay is like. It is a very fine, very powdery substance that if you breathe it, is just like breathing asbestos materials. Your operators are dumping that into a hopper every day it should be being done in a separate room where you have adequate ventilation to change out the volume of air in the room every few minutes. It's sitting in the middle of your water treatment plant. There's no separate room available. The other concern for your water operators is chlorine. Your chlorine is being injected in a separate room, and we'll talk more about your chlorination process in a little bit here. It's very complicated compared to how most municipalities chlorinate. Um, and your operators are at significant risk from breathing chlorine gas. Other concerns. Um, you have two clarifiers. When we inspected, both of the waste lines from those clarifiers were plugged. Since then, your water treatment plant operator has messed around with one of them enough to get it free so it's operating correctly. Um, the second clarifier is still being run on temporary hoses at this point. Your water treatment plant has a generator. All water treatment plants are required to have a generator. Even though you're not pumping the water through your plant, all of your chemical additions are being pumped. Your backwash water is being pumped. You have a ton of instruments that are registering turbidity and uh, particle counters and chlorine checkers all the way through the plant all require power, so you're required to have a generator. You don't currently have an operating generator. Um, the general condition of the water treatment plant is not good. Um, cracks in exterior walls, cracks in interior walls, um, even just the painting and maintenance is really very poor. Um, all the water lines are required to be color-coded, labeled, so you know whether it's raw water, treat wa treated water, um, wastewater, and they're all supposed to have directional arrows on, arrows on them, so your operators can't make a mistake and feed a bunch of untreated water downtown. You don't have any of that labeling in your plant. And another great concern, as I mentioned before, and I will keep mentioning, is the limited size in your plant to do any kind of expansion. The chemicals that you use for treatment, as I talked about coming into what they call the coffin, and just dripping in, that doesn't provide adequate mixing. When you've got a thousand gallons per minute going through there and you're just drip, drip, dripping your chemicals in, you're not getting adequate mixing, so you're not getting adequate treatment. The existing clarifiers that you have are too small. The water is flowing through them too fast, above what, is what the regulated standard is, 
So again, you don't get adequate solids removal going through your clarifiers. The biggest concern with that is the organic material. Um, those organic materials are the precursors to disinfection byproducts. It's one of the reasons that we see elevated disinfection byproducts in your system. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and obviously, if you get inadequate solids removal, you won't have, your water won't meet the clarity standards. You'll have too much turbidity in it. Further concerns, the complexity of your chlorine system. I mentioned that you use an isocyanurate um, chemical for chlorination. It is actually delivered in solid chunks. They're not really pellets, they're not really pucks, they're just kind of random hard shapes. Those are then dumped into a hopper, uh, again, which is dangerous for your operators. You have to run hot water through that hopper to melt those pellets, for lack of a better word, and then that solution is injected into your water to treat as a disinfection. Most water treatment plants don't have to deal with any kind of solid. They either have a gas, which you previously had, or simply a liquid feed like you do the rest of your chemicals. Um, much safer, much, much less mechanical things to break, let me put it that way. Um, two of the three boil water orders that you've had in the last year have been because of the complexity of this system and single points of failure within it. Um, when it comes to, I mentioned you have two pumps for each one of your chemical feeds called redundancy. It's great. It's a great thing to have. Unfortunately, most water treatment plants, if you have two pumps sitting there waiting to run polymer, if this one is pumping and fails, the automated system then turns this pump on. It's already plumbed in and ready to go. That is not true of any of the pumps other than the backwash pumps in your water treatment plant. They all require an operator to physically be aware that that pump has failed first and then physically swip, swap, swap out those pumps. Um, lack of redundancy. Hold that thought. Your plant has to operate 24-7, 365 days a year in order to produce the water that you use every day. The maximum production that you can get through your water treatment plant is about 2.1 million gallons a day. Your big day is about 2.7, 2.8 million gallons. It is a peak day, like a 4th of July weekend day for you. The plant can never shut off. One of the reasons it can never shut off is you don't have redundancy. You literally can't shut off one clarifier to fix it, or you can't meet those daily demands. I'm not seeing a bunch of blank looks here, so I don't think I've Say lost it again. Any. You can't shut up. So you have two clarifiers. Most plants would have three or four or five clarifiers if they needed to run two to meet the demands of the village, they would have an additional one or possibly two. You do not. You have two that have to be running constantly. They can never get shut down to be repaired or maintained or the village will run out of water. It's that simple. Lack of redundancy. It's crippling to your water operators. It's also my boss is going to throw me dirty looks here. It's also why it costs you so much for water. Most water treatment plants your size run an eight hour day and that's it. Their plant is either automated for evening hours, it's automated to come on as needed during the evening, or it doesn't run at all other than eight hours a day. Those personnel costs are part of what's killing you. Um, so again, I already talked about it's near impossible to schedule time for maintenance because you don't have the redundancy. Um, and it, that lack of redundancy is probably why your reservoir has never been dredged. Because everybody was too afraid to stir up that reservoir and create dirty water that your treatment plant couldn't handle treating.
Change of date. Um, you may have heard previously in the news that on April 16th, the Clearwell was going to get clear, cleaned. Um, literally, as I was walking in the door this evening, it was changed to April 15th. The contractor is coming in to clean, clean the Clearwell. The Clearwell is that tank where the water sits after it's been treated so that it is in contact with chlorine. That clear well is what caused a boil order last, uh, don't hold me to the date, June, July-ish, um, when you had a boil water order for turbidity. It was because that clear well was inspected and there were so many solids on the bottom of it that it stirred it up enough to cause a boil water order. We're hoping to avoid a boil water order while they are actually vacuuming the solids out of the bottom of the clear well. The only way that we are going to avoid a, bo a boil water order is with the people who have village customers, let me put it that way, assistance. If the village can drop its water use by about a third for two or three days, we can get that clear well cleaned without having to run the water treatment plant. If they have to run the water treatment plant, during that probably two day period, you're gonna be on a boil water order because there's no way they can clean that clear well, that tank, without stirring up enough solids to put you on a boil order. Um, so the best thing we're gonna do is we're gonna ask people to conserve. We'll start getting the message out tomorrow to let people know to drop their usage. Um, they plan on starting to clean that tank on Monday morning. Best way to avoid usage, don't run the dishwasher for five dishes, make sure it's full. Don't do laundry. If you're gonna go to a laundromat, go to one in Dunkirk, don't go to one in Fredonia. So in summary, one of the big concerns is the stream bank stabilization. Um, there is significant equipment that needs to be added so that you have redundancy and significant automation that needs to be done to that plant to bring it up to code. Um, the continued and routine maintenance, should you choose to keep maintaining this plant, that continued maintenance and operation costs never go away. Just because you may invest millions now to upgrade the plant doesn't mean that you're not going to have to put not only money into paying off those loans or however you get the money, but you're going to have to keep putting money away to cover the cost of the next repairs. Pumps don't last forever. Average age of a water treatment plant, the design age that engineers use is 20 years before you're replacing major components or upgrading. Um, and again, you're gonna operate 24 seven, 365 until you either have more storage or more redundancy. Finished water storage. What 10 state standards requires is that you have an average day storage plus the amount of water that you would need for fire flow. For Fredonia, your average day is around about 1.3 million gallons. Your fire flow is determined by a really complicated formula used by a bunch of actuaries for the fire, uh, whatever the state fire, I can't think of the word. Um, fire and insurance division um, comes up with, you don't even have a day's storage, an average day's storage, let alone any extra storage for fire flow. And believe it or not, your fire flows are higher than most everybody in the area because of the pressure on your system. An average fire hydrant, if you go out there and crank it open full blast, is gonna put out between 500 and 1500 gallons a minute because your pressure in your water system is about three times a normal system, you're gonna put out a whole heck of a lot more water than that. So you have woefully inadequate amount of storage. That pressure is part of what causes the dis challenges in your distribution system. A normal water supplies distribution system has between 60 and 80 PSI, pounds per square inch, of water pressure in their water mains. Yours where it touches Fredonia, or where it touches Dunkirk on the north end of the system here, is between 140 and 150 PSI. 
if you were to build your system from scratch right now, the state would never allow you to have those, permit, those PSIs permitted in your system. You would have to put pressure reducing valves within your system to control that. That high pressure <laughs> makes it miserable for your distribution operators to keep the pipes from breaking. The more pressure you have on a pipe, and the older the pipe is, the more likely it is to break. And remember when I said Webster Road storage tank only runs on pumps? Yeah, our bottom bullet there, every time those pumps come on, that 150 PSI increases. That's why you have brakes when the pumps are running off the Webster Road tank. That high pressure isn't only disadvantageous to your lines that are in the ground, it's not good for the lines in people's homes either. You're more likely to have a break in a water line in your house because of those pressures. You're more likely to have your dishwasher or your clothes washer fail because of those pressures. Ever sitting around after dinner and hear the valves in your dishwasher like banging on and off as it goes through cycles? That's because of that excess pressure. So yes, where it may be a benefit that you're not pumping a lot of water downtown, it's also really kind of a hazard and makes your system more expensive to operate. Um, we already talked about these a little bit, so I'm not gonna dwell on it. Um, there was a unique boil order in September of 2020. There was an algal bloom on the reservoir and they were changing the media out in the filters at the same time. Media gets changed in your filters about every four or five years. Um, so that's an added cost of operation. And it just so happened to sync up when we had a bloom in the reservoir. Um, so that was a boil order. The February of 23 and the February of 24 were both due to that chlorine system that I said was so complicated. Um, the one in February of 23 when the chlorine pump went down, the backup chlorine pump, the operator was there, he saw the pump went down, he was there to switch it out, but the secondary pump didn't work. So you were on a boil order because the water wasn't treated adequately. Um, and likewise, the one in just this past February um, was because there was a blockage in the water line that feeds the hot water heater that feeds the chlorination system. If you take some of those steps out of there, you could have dodged the bullets with a couple of these boil orders. Um, and the one in Ju June of 23 was, as I discussed, from when the tank was being cleaned, or the clear well was being inspected, rather. I want to reinforce again that pulling water from Dunkirk through the interconnect does not prevent the village from being on a boil order. Several reasons. One, the line that connects you is too small. If you turn the pumps on at the interconnect and ramp them up all the way, one, you won't get water up to like Spoden Road and, and the folks in the higher parts of your system. Those pumps just aren't big enough to create that amount of pressure. But two, you are going to dewater that whole area of Vineyard Drive where all of your commercial businesses are. You'll suck that area dry with those pumps. And three, when those pumps are running, they're pushing water backwards through your pipes, essentially. They're pushing it the wrong direction. And anytime you do that, it's going to stir up the water, stir up the solids that have built up on the pipes. And you're gonna be on a boil water order anyways because the water's gonna be too cloudy, too turbid. For comparison, Dunkirk's water treatment plant. They actually use chlorine gas they pump, during the summertime, they pump it right out to their intake in the lake. They do that to control the zebra mussels building up on the intake pipes, but it also has the benefit of reacting and destroying the organic compounds that would later create disinfection byproducts in the system. The water actually runs from a 36 inch pipe in the lake to the pump or to the plant by gravity it is then, though, pumped through the process 
using raw water treatment pumps, they've got plenty of redundancy. I believe they have four separate water, raw water treatment pumps of varying capacities that they can use to do that. They inject polyaluminum chloride. They're not injecting it into an open tank. They are injecting it into a line, which then goes through two rapid mix basins. So the water gets adequately mixed with the chemical. It goes to the flocculation chambers then. Flocculation, think of a big swimming pool that is slowly being stirred so that all those little clumps of dirt have a chance to run into each other and become bigger clumps of dirt. The water then goes to the clarifiers and the numbers in parentheses is the, the number of units that they have. So the water then goes to the clarifiers, which is a big swimming pool that's not being stirred, which allows all those solids to settle to the bottom of the pool. And then the water off the top of the pool goes to their filters. They too have waste streams because they backwash their filters just like Fredonia does. However, they don't have to have a speedies permit. They don't have to have a separate tank for it. It goes right to their wastewater treatment plant. And so does the dirty water off the bottom of their clarifiers. We're also not concerned about an interconnection between the drinking water and the backwash water because they have a completely separate backwash tank that provides the water that they need to backwash the filters. So there's no risk of that interconnection there. Um, I did for, <laughs> to keep it all in one slide, I did skip, they have a clear well outside their treatment plant just like you do and the high lift pumps pull out of that clear well and distribute water to their system. Their tanks are uniquely different than what you have on Webster Road though. Their tanks are more like we see in most municipalities and that they do what we call floating on the system. So if there's extra water produced at the treatment plant, those tanks fill. So every day they're kind of raising and lowering depending on what the use in the system is. If the use is about average, the tank will still stay full. If the use is above average, those tanks will drop down a little bit. If the use goes down, then the tanks fill back up. That's all automatically done at the water treatment plant through their SCADA system. That, that doesn't require any decision to be made by a water operator. Um, and yeah, that's, that's all the pressure that is provided to their, to get the water all the way out to Brockton is those high lift pumps. So the differences in treatment plants. Fredonia uses five chemicals to treat. Injecting, nope, you use five chemicals to treat. Dunkirk use t uses two. They do inject chlorine at two different places, but they still use two different chemicals. You cannot treat pre-treat pre at the Fredonia water treatment plant. You could not pump chlorine out to the intake to have it burn up the organic compounds in the water before it got to the treatment plant because you have nothing in the treatment plant to remove those organic compounds. You would exceed on disinfection byproduct levels, which we'll talk about in a minute. Dunker can pretreat. Uh, again, they use it both to control zebra mussels in the intake line with the added benefit that it burns up those organic compounds. Fredonia has upflow clarifiers. Dunkirk has coagulation and sedimentation basins. So they have two steps where you have one. Um, the filter media, again, you have anthracite and sand. Um, anthracite is coal, but it is not activated carbon. It does not remove any organics other than through straining means. It does not absorb anything. Dunkirk has granular activated carbon on their filters. So they are removing disinfection byproduct precursors. If they would happen to suck up any polyfluorinated chemicals, any gasoline, oils, you know, heaven forbid if a truck full or a tanker full of oil blew up out there, one, their water line is in 40 feet of water, so the chance of it being impacted are, is pretty darn slim. But if it did happen, They've got granular activated carbon on their filters that is going to remove all of that. Um, Fredonia, once your water is treated, 
your water is corrosive to the pipes. So you add a blended phosphate to help control lead and coppers. Dunkirk water is not corrosive after treatment, so they don't have to add anything. These are water quality results from the 2022 annual water quality reports. The 23s aren't due to be done until the end of the month, so I don't have the precious numbers. But a um, little explanation, microbiological contaminants. We look at turbidity because the microbiological contaminants like to hide in the turbidity. They hide in the particles of dirt so that they don't get disinfected or removed. You can see the value has to be less than one. Neither of you exceed that. Fernonia's 0.39, Dunker's 0.129. If it's in black, it's not a violation. The violation for turbidity came with the secondary treatment rule is that 95% of the samples that you take and you're sampling every filter every four hours, every time it's running, 95% of those samples have to be less than the 0.3 turbidity units. Last year, only 93.75% of Fredonias were, so that's a violation. Um, I suspect that this year's number will actually be a little bit worse uh, because the turbidity numbers were pretty high in December. Inorganic contaminants, both Fredonia and Dunkirk have to test for all of the things in that inorganic contaminant block. You can see, as I said, Dunkirk does not treat for corrosion control to limit lead and copper, Fredonia does. Even though you're treating, your range of samples, I believe it was two samples this year that exceeded the action level of 15. Fredonia had one, their next highest sample was like 0.4. Um, we, they have much better lead quality water without any treatment than Fredonia does with treatment. The copper is not really an issue, it's low for both of you, um, but again, you treat and they do not. The rest of those inorganic contaminants, barium, chromium, nitrate, thallium, nickel, you all test for them. Um, the numbers presented there are what was detected in Fredonia's water. The numbers all, all the way on the right are the maximum contaminant levels that are allowed. As you can see, there's no cause for concern there. But there is a difference in water quality. Dunkirk just had a bunch of non-detects where those chemicals weren't even identified. The secondary organic contaminants, you actually have to test for those because you have a reservoir and because you have corrosive water. Um, they are things that either build up in the reservoir over time or are known to cause issues with corrosion. Um, therefore, you have to sample for them, and Dunkirk was, does not. Either way, they're not an issue, they're all within range. The stage two disinfection byproducts, Fredonia has to sample four times, four different locations per quarter. You are actually doing elevated sampling based on your results. Dunkirk is only doing two samples per quarter because they qualify for reduced sampling, reduced monitoring. Um, as you can see, the haloacetic acids aren't really an issue. Your highest result was 39, and the limit is 60. However, the trihalomethanes is always, we kind of hold our breath when we get the samples in. Um, your highest last year was 76.1. The limit is 80. If you hit 80, you're required to put in additional treatment. Um, and as you can see, or Dunkirk's was only 38 was their highest. And that sample was actually taken out in Brockton and the farther away you go from the treatment plant, the higher those levels get. The disinfection by byproducts build in the distribution system. Synthetic organic contaminants, you're sampling once every 18 months. Um, if you have a detect, then you have to sample one per once per quarter. You have not had, Fredonia has not had a detect. Dunkirk did have a detect of 0.05, which is what, 200 times less than the maximum contaminant level. But regardless, they are now required to monitor quarterly, and they have not seen it again in their water. I think it's been two or three quarters that it has been not detected. 
emerging contaminants, the UCMR. So Safe Drinking Water Act of 1996 requires the EPA every five years to have water systems look at a group of contaminants that are known to be present in drinking water, have known health concerns, but do not have a current maximum contaminant level that is regulated by the EPA. For small systems like Fredonia, EPA considers a small system anything under 10,000 people. Your names all get thrown in a hat and the EPA picks a certain number of small systems. Um, and it can be anything from a mobile home park to a small municipality um, that is required to do the testing. And either the federal or state government would pay for that testing for you. The larger systems are required to do the sampling regardless. 100% of the sample or 100% of the systems that have more than 10,000 people in them are required to do the sampling and they have to pay for it themselves. Um, this is how the whole PFAS, PFAS, PFNA, that's how that group was identified. And as a matter of fact, just today, the EPA promulgated new regulations based on the UCMR study that was done for that group of contaminants. When it comes to emerging contaminants, and I'm gonna use the newest PFOS, PFOA, PFNA, um, we have not had a detect uh, at either Fredonia or Dunkirk system, which is great. However, were we to have a detect of any of those contaminants, your system doesn't have any treatment processes currently in it that would remove any of those contaminants. You can't add, according to an engineering study done by our Brian Aguirre, who was the village engineer in 2013, your filter beds are actually not deep enough to add granular activated carbon to the top of them to get removal of organic contaminants. Um, and there's, anybody who's been up there before, there's really no space at the water treatment plant to make the plant bigger. Um, it's really notched into a little cliff there and there's just no room. Um, as I said before, Dunkirk does have granular activated carbon. It's gonna remove any of those organics and heaven forbid they have to, they have space to expand. I'm gonna hand it back over to Jessica. All right, so I hope you guys are all still awake because I know this is a lot of information. <laughs> it's a lot of numbers. It's a lot of technical talk. We tried to keep it as simple as we could while still providing you information because that's what we have been hearing is the village wants the details. Residents want to know what the issues are. So you asked for it. That's what we gave to you. Um, so let me talk about a few of the sort of extra new and emerging water quality concerns. We've heard a lot of concern about microplastics. The difficult problem that we have with comparing microplastics is that people use the term microplastic and they think it means one thing, but it doesn't. Microplastics come in different shapes, different sizes, different chemical compositions, different forms. There's no one way to qualify what a microplastic is, how to sample for it, how to concentrate it to analyze it, what the analysis would even look like if you were able to sample and collect it properly. So it, it's difficult for us to give you any strong answers about microplastics because the research is all still ongoing. There, there's just not a standard in place to talk about microplastics and to really compare microplastics within a system. Um, however, having said that, what we can say for certain is that microplastics are pretty much everywhere at this point. Um, they're carried around the world, around the environment, through water runoff into streams, into rivers, lakes, oceans. They're in every water body in the world. They're also carried through the air. We've all seen plastic bags hanging in the trees, rolling around on the wind currents. Microplastics are being moved around by the air. Those fine particles that are in everybody's nice, warm, fuzzy fleeces that we wear, you put those things in the dryer to dry, they get shoved out into the world out of your dryer vent, and microplastics have just been put out into the world from your dryer. So 
although the concern has been that Lake Erie is lousy with microplastics, while the reservoir doesn't have microplastics, it's not an accurate statement, and there's no research to qualify or even start to qualify the statement. Um, again, what we can say for certain is that microplastics are throughout the world. Um, they're found in sea ice. They've been found at the Antarctic tundra. They're everywhere. They're getting everywhere. And they're also already being ingested. Water bottles, microplastics. Uh, they've been found in bottled beer. They've been found in sea salt. Um, and if you're a person who enjoys fishing or game hunting and you eat your catches, you are certainly going to be finding some microplastics in there. Uh, so again, this just reaffirms this idea that there's not an approved sampling method for microplastics. There's not an approved testing method. There's no way for us to even start to t address the issue of micro microplastics in the reservoir versus in Lake Erie because there's just not the research there to support it. Uh, the other sort of point to microplastics is truthfully, we don't really know what they do to our health. Again, there's not the research there to look at what these different microplastics in their large umbrella of variation do to us. So we, even if we do know how to quantify and test for them, the question still remains is what are they actually doing? Are they actually having a negative health benefit or a negative health impact? Um, so that's just a few points about microplastics that we wanted to share. One of the other questions that we've, and concerns that we've heard is the topic of blue-green algae and harmful algal blooms. Um, folks have certainly raised concerns about blue-green algal blooms occurring on Lake Erie and thinking that the reservoir is not at risk for blue-green algae harmful algal blooms. Uh, let me, before I go too, farther, too much farther, let me just explain that the common name is blue-green algae. Science recognizes the organism as cyanobacteria. So when we talk about blue-green algae, the concern for impacting humans is the potential toxins that this organism creates. And they're called cyanotoxins from the name cyanobacteria. The organism themselves, they're supposed to be here. They've been here longer than humans have. They've been here billions of years. So it's not an invasive, it's not some new organism that we don't know, um, we don't know how it got here. It belongs here. The difference that we've been seeing is how the environment is changing and how humans are impacting waterways that can support these blooms of blue-green algae, of cyanobacteria. When blooms happen, there is a potential for cyanotoxins to be produced. Unfortunately, there's no nice, easy visual cue when a bloom is, tox is creating toxin. And as Courtney can go on for hours, there's, there's now really great... <laughs> Could, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, there's really no great um, understanding of what triggers uh, toxin production. Um, the only thing that we think we know is that toxin production is more likely when a bloom is formed. Um, so blue-green algal blooms are more likely in water that is warm, in water that has a lot of nutrients added to it. Jessica, could I interrupt? We need to be thoughtful about our time lapse. Can you compact your remarks? Would that be a fair request? I'm pretty much done with, I guess the last point for Habs is that um, Fredonia Reservoir does have blue-green algae in it. The Fredonia Water Treatment Plant does test for toxins on a routine basis in the summer. The Dunkirk Water Treatment Plant is not required to do so. That's it? <laughs> That's what I got for Habs, yeah. Um, the last part is just 
us following up with, I can just take it now. Um, the last few slides are in relation to how the county health department is involved with regulating water supplies. So we enforce regulations under these two different documents. 10 state standards is the bottom one, part five, those are what we call these in our shorthand jargon, part five and 10 state standards. So none of the citations, deficiencies that we've noted are made up. They are coming from documents that we are required to enforce. These are the rough timeline of what has happened in recent time that has led up to the amount of attention that has been given to the Fredonia Water Treatment Plant and the reservoir and the comments uh, related to the health department being so involved. It, it's our job to be involved. When we cite deficiencies, when we find violations, it's our job to enforce the standards, to enforce the regulations, and to follow through with the timelines. So that's what we've been doing. Um, and then, I guess we'll just move this along so we can get to the questions. Um, you know, the, the county health department has every intention to continue working with the village as they either address their current issues, work to find new solutions, whatever the case is. Um, and we're glad to be here today to help provide some information and clarification. Thank you to village officials for allowing us this opportunity. Uh, thank you to you folks for coming out today and listening to any of the folks who may be viewing from home. Thank you for being part of understanding your process. Uh, and lastly, a big thank you to all of the Fredonia water operators and the DPW staff who keep your system going every day and are the ones who are on the front line of protecting your public health every day. Thank you very much. Uh, folks, if you'd like to just stand for a, for a minute or two. Uh, we. We, uh, we'll get to your questions and we'll, we'll do it now, but um, it, it's, it's been uh, an interesting and uh, information-filled evening so far, so if you feel like you'd just like to stand up and stretch your legs, uh, feel perfectly free. Uh, you've been submitting your questions and, uh, yeah, yes? Oh, I do, thank you very much, I didn't see those. So uh, this is a question regarding uh, water quality. Uh, does either facility have adequate ability to filter, I think then there are four uh, uh, particular uh, uh, materials that this question focuses on. First, the ability to address algae blooms. You sort of opened that conversation briefly. Uh, secondly, microplastics. Also, I think you began discussion of that. Uh, don't feel like you need to, to uh, repeat yourself, but if you do, then feel free. Three, other contaminants such as phosphorus, nitrogen, or other fertilizers. And then fourthly, sewage. So this was a question having to do with the ability to adequately filter all four of these contaminants. Can I steal that from you so I address them all? Sure. Um, let me start with sewage because that is the easy one. Um, both water treatment plants do adequately treat sewage on a daily basis. It, it's not like the deer and the beaver and whatnot that are running around the reservoir and the approved or unapproved uh, septic systems that are in the watershed area, that's all contributing sewage to the reservoir, um, much like upstream wastewater treatment plants contribute sewage to Lake Erie. So sewage, yes. Uh, ability to address algal blooms. Algal blooms are typically addressed in a uh, couple different ways. Um, one, you can burn up the microtoxin with um, an oxidant like chlorine. Uh, you can filter it out with some of it out with a standard filter, which you both have. And it can, the, some of the microtoxin can also be removed with activated carbon. 
Dunkirk has activated carbon and they have a, the ability to add the oxidant at the head of the intake um, to address the microtoxins. Fredonia does not. Uh, microplastic, there is no known treatment for microplastic at this time. There is no standard for it. Um, and other contaminants such as phosphate, nitrogen, fertilizers, um, typically those are not of concern at a water treatment plant because those things that are essentially a fertilizer are more likely to be taken up by the plants. Um, you will see that if we flip back to the slide with the water quality results on it, there's a little bit of nitrate, nitrogen in Fredonia's reservoir. Um, yeah, you're gonna get nitrogen through the system, um, but it, it's generally not something you worry about treating to remove at a treatment plant. Thank you. Uh, this question concerns climate change effects. Given climate change and large-scale rain events, what can the reservoir withstand before becoming non-viable? Uh, please. Yeah, we, can, we can maybe take a swing at the sort of general climate change expectations. Um, so some of the things that we're looking at going forward um, more broadly, where there's work right now looking at New York State to have a state climate action plan that's in process. I think it's wrapping up shortly. Um, but in terms of general things that we look at, you know, changing, changes in temperature, changes in precipitation. Um, one thing that's interesting is that we're looking at the total amount of precipitation that lands, but also the way it gets delivered. So it's possible that you might not see a change in the total amount of precipitation that we get in a given area, but the way we get it matters a great deal. So rather than having many small rain events, sort of gently soaking drizzles, right, like we had a little bit today, you might have a long stretch of drought and then a large rain event storm. So the frequency of large events has been increasing, especially through the Northeast in the last several decades. And so that's a big, you know, so the total amount matters, but also the way it's coming into the watershed. You can imagine that sort of a gently soaking rain that's slowly trickling into the reservoir would be quite different than having really dry land and then having a huge pulse of water, pulse of water crash into that and rip everything down, right? So um, in terms of, those are some of the things that you would look for with respect to climate change um, that would especially affect the reservoir. Cover. Yeah, and I guess the second half was what the wa reservoir could withstand. Um, and I have to hand wave a little bit, because that is actually a study that need to be done. But as far as what you'd expect to see would be during those more intense rainstorms, just like Dr. Wigdell Perry was saying, is you would have more erosion um, if the land was previously dry. Um, it'd be a very different delivery system, possibly also an increase in turbidity, um, but not in terms of like any specifics on what the weather reservoir can withstand. There's no number for that. Um, it would be more of concerned about what the treatment facility could provide if the turbidity was, you know, rapidly raised. With that wash-in comes all the nutrients that can also relate to increasing uh, frequency of algae blooms. So if you're bringing a lot of nutrients in from the watershed and those big pulses, you might also create other problems um, that are more likely to occur. The next question is, since 9-11, many towns have drawn down reservoirs because they needed to be covered. I'm not certain I'm following this, but you might know better than I here. They needed to be covered. Is this something that affects our reservoir? Actually, the reservoirs that have been drawn down because of the need to be covered aren't raw water. Yeah, I can say this twice. Raw water reservoirs. The reservoirs that had to be covered were treated water reservoirs. So some cities, such as Rochester, um, have actual reservoirs like in the middle of downtown that very much look like your reservoir. It's just a pipe that fills it and a pipe that goes out to the customers with no treatment in between. Those are the reservoirs that need to be covered, not the raw water reservoirs. The next question is this. Is federal or state funding available to bring water treatment plant compliance up to date. Uh, there's a, there's a follow-on, which is, if so, is anyone guiding or helping the mayor and trustees in securing funding? I hope so. 
I mean, the short answer, you know, again, we're not able to talk about finances. We're not the ones going out and seeking grants on behalf of the village. It we are certainly happy to share information about what is available and what we are aware of, but that would be up to the village and or their engineering firm to be seeking grants. I would say there is federal and state funding, but if we have a, a representative of uh, Fredonia still here or here who would care to say a word about this? Uh, yes, no? Uh, I, 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 I think the point of this panel was to focus on... No, I understand. Yeah. No, I understand, but I think, you know, I think we can reassure people that efforts are being made in this respect. I, at least that would be my understanding. So uh, the next question is economic uh, concerns economic uh, development impact. If a company needed to locate in the area and the company needed a large supply of reliable water, could Fredonia support it? And also, could Dunkirk support it? Fredonia's water treatment plant is at the max of its capacity. You do not have capacity at that treatment plant as it exists, nor with the modifications that were recommended to increase the number of customers that you supply, either residential or commercial. Dunkirk's treatment plant runs about half of their maximum capacity on a daily basis. Dunkirk has capacity. And this would apply as well to a hospital located in the village of Fredonia? Yes, it would apply to any commercial or residential user, large or small. This, uh, any, anything further? Thank you, okay, good. Uh, we are so lucky to have such knowledgeable, <laughs> smart public servants. We, we weren't gonna talk about this, were we? <laughs> no, we are lucky to have smart uh, public servants in our community, very impressive uh, team from the Department of Health. I certainly agree. Thank, Thank you, that folks. wasn't a question, but a, con a statement, <laughs> yes. By all means, clap. How will we protect the thriving ecosystem of the reservoir site? So, I mean, the understanding that we have of where the village currently stands is they are interested in pursuing drawing down the reservoir. So that doesn't mean eliminating it. That means drawing it down. That means that there will continue to be a body of water there. And the landowner can decide how that parcel is used in the future. What that looks like is going to be up to the village of Fredonia, the town of Pomfret, how they want to proceed with that land. There's certainly opportunities to promote recreation in the area, uh, to promote it as a educational resource for SUNY Fredonia, something like the College Lodge facilities. There's all sorts of opportunities, but that would be up to the village to figure out how they want to use and sustain that parcel of land. Can I just add one caveat to that to, to clarify and make sure that folks understand Drawing down the reservoir does not mean completely ripping out the dam and having it return to being a creek. I think that's one thing that we've not said in the past. That is not what is being proposed here. What is being proposed is lowering the water level behind the dam to make the dam safer, make it able to handle the pool that is behind it, not completely destroying that body of water. Thank you. Is the health department's primary concern over the reservoir as Fredonia's water source due to one water quality or I guess out of date inadequate treatment or structural integ integrity of the aging earthen dam I suppose maybe or all of all of them so three water quality out of date equipment 
integrity of the earthen dam, uh, how, how are these, uh, in what order are these a uh, concern of the health department? Well, so it all starts with the reservoir. I mean, if the reservoir doesn't have the quantity to keep up, is filling in with sediment, is potentially going to experience you know, drought events. I mean, that's our, that's our concern. The water treatment plant doesn't matter unless you have the reservoir. So th the true answer is all of the above because we think of it as an entire system. We don't parcel it out and think of it as piece by piece. The entire system needs to be functioning and needs to meet regulation in order to be a reliable, sustainable source of water for the village of Fredonia. Thank you. Uh, the PowerPoint presentation, will this be made available online and where? Yes, I, I tried to make the slides, um, you know, clear and um, explain them well without having to hear my voice over them. So with the exception of I have to edit the slide that says April 16th and make it April 15th, I do plan on sharing all of the slides with the village and they are welcome to put it on their website or however they would like to display it. So 15th or 16th? It is the 15th. Yes, it is Monday. <laughs> but my slides were created before we had that information. Please explain the Army Corps of Engineers designation of the Fredonia Reservoir, and then related, explain the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation designation for the same. I don't know that the uh, Army Corps has a designation. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the dam is regulated by the DEC, and that's that Class C high hazard dam, um, which I, I think I explained in the slides, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the concern with that dam is the reason that it's l classified as that Class C high hazard dam is the potential impact should that dam fail. Um, but again, that's a, it's a DEC, New York State DEC listing, uh, not an Army Corps of Engineer listing. I don't know if you guys have any other. No, it's a re and it's a reservoir versus a natural body of water. So in terms of DEC considerations, that's, that's also accounted for. Is the Dunkirk water, is Dunkirk water considered north water, part of the north water district, I think this is? And is Fredonia part of the district? So it, it becomes confusing. The, Fredonia actually has what is labeled the North End Water District, um, which is a portion of Route 60. Dunkirk, if you're looking, if you're asking, is Dunkirk part of the North, Northern Chautauqua County Water District, Dunkirk supplies 100% of the water to the Northern Chautauqua County Water District. Fredonia, at this point, is not part of either the North Chautauqua County Water District or doesn't get water from the city of Dunkirk. Does that answer the question? Why is Fredonia water corrosive and Dunkirk's is not? Uh, you did bring this up, and I think it would be well to, to have a, a, another brief. Anybody want to dust off their water chemistry? Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it all comes down to the chemistry of the water. Um, essentially, Fredonia's water is not saturated with things like calcium carbonate or um, anything else, so it, it wants to reach equilibrium and dissolve the things that are around it, um, versus Dunkirk water is saturated, um, so it, it, if anything would like leave a little car calcium carbonate behind in the water lines versus trying to erode those water lines. Any... <laughs> It's been two year, many years since chemistry class, folks. If I could give you an A plus, I would. Um, <laughs> that was great. Um, I, I think maybe the uh, just because the, the phrases that used with the you know in the presentation and just scientists in general um, should be clarified a little bit. So what Natalie said is exactly right. Um, but the additions that are put in the Fredonia water itself help you know keep the pipes themselves maintained. Um, in the sense that everything that is trapped inside of the water that would otherwise be in it gets stuck to the pipe wall by the orthophosphate, or the blended phosphate? Yeah, blended phosphate. Thank you. Um, lots of documents to read the last <laughs> few days. Um, 
and that basically keeps it out of your drinking water, right? And keeps the pipes from being eaten up by the drinking water that's provided, buffers that all out. Um, I think that's pretty much all I have to add to that, though. Can all the reservoir deficiencies uh, mentioned tonight be fixed, or is it at a dead end? Did Fredonia, I'm sorry, did Dunkirk have a total water shutdown where the city didn't have water? Can't. Do you guys want to talk about current state of the reservoir? Oh, so one of, in terms of like our studies that we've been working on? Yeah, so one of the things that we started, um, we, we began a project, uh, Dr. Lanning and I started this in uh, a little bit, well, last spring, I guess, we started working on. <laughs> it's been a year. Yeah, and so we've been working with the village more closely in the past couple of years, which has been great to start to build stronger connections between the, the university and the, the village proper. Um, and so some of the things that we were looking at, we're trying to understand as we're looking forward, what the history has been for the reservoir, what the environment, um, what the response has been to different environmental conditions, how stable is the system. Um, and so one way that we've been trying to tackle that has been to work on what's called paleoecology, where we go back through time, uh, looking at the sediments at the bottom of the reservoir and look for different markers, different fossil remains, different things that get preserved there, different chemistry, and to try to build a story going back through time to understand how things may or may not have changed. What this gives us is more context, right? So we might have some more recent instrumental data, uh, measurements from the lab, but we haven't, we don't necessarily have the whole story, right? Because we don't, we don't have those same kinds of lab measurements going back through the early 1900s. Um, and so what we've been working on has been actually to bring in a colleague through funding um, from the Williams Visiting Professor um, Fund at the university to uh, bring in a colleague to help us do this project. And so we actually went out and cored the reservoir in two places in August to try to start to build this history record. Now, a lot of things sort of happened in the fall in terms of the timeline of this. And so we wish we had started this project a few years earlier. It is a slow process, um, if you can imagine, to collect uh, several feet of mud from different places in the reservoir, cut them up in tiny little slices, and then process all of that for multiple measurements that we're trying to track. So we've had actually several students working on the project. We've had some really good success so far. Mm -hmm. um, so we have several things that are coming, but it's not quite ready yet. The hope is that by looking back through time to look at the chemistry and the biology, what lives in the lake and what's left behind, that it gives us that idea of, is the reservoir stable or not? Um, is it changing? How does it respond to different things like Hurricane Agnes or drought events that have happened? What, what occurs within the ecosystem itself? Um, so it's really, we're coming at it form of the research bent, but we're hopeful that this will be useful information in the future. Um, it won't be ready in time right now to make decisions because it's a very, like I said, long, slow process. Um, but we're excited to, you know, we'll be sharing that information as that, as that comes up. Um, and we're excited for the opportunity to have our students involved in that uh, and, and to be part of that. They're doing really great work. The, the second question was, did Dunkirk have a total water shutdown where the city didn't have water? Do we know if... Uh, I think they're probably talking now. You, oh, the main break yeah. outside of the Dunkirk plant. Do you want to talk about you were? I wasn't involved in water then. Yeah, either. unfortunately, n neither Natalie I were. I was not director. Natalie was not in her position as senior water s resource specialist. Um, our very surface level understanding is that there was a main break outside of the Dunkirk plant that did affect water distribution within the city. But at no point was Dunkirk without water. There were certainly areas within the city that had lower pressure um, and, you know, w certainly weren't taking fulfilling showers those days. Um, but the city was never without water, to our understanding. Correct. Thank you. Is there an existing timeline for correcting the deficiencies in the existing Fredonia system? If not, why not? So that's one of the things that we kind of glossed through at the end of the slides here. So part five of the New York State Sanitary Code actually requires the village to within 30 days of the issuance of a report from our office to either address all of the deficiencies listed in that report or to within 120 days, 
have a compliance plan in place to address those deficiencies. The report, our report last year was delivered to the village on July 15th, um, which gave them till August 15th or 14th to get some kind of proof to us that all the deficiencies had been resolved, which was not realistic, um, or to have a plan to us to resolve those deficiencies. Um, we did receive correspondence from the village um, that really didn't quite meet the standards of part five, um, wasn't enough to meet the requirements of the regulations. So subsequent talks were had with village officials and county officials, um, involved your engineering firm, Labella, heard that um, even though part five would require you to have a game plan in place by no longer than November 15th of last year, um, the county was willing to kick that date back six weeks uh, because Labella promised to deliver their report on November 15th. Um, so the health department moved our date uh, where we needed to know which way the village was going to go to the last working day of the year, December 29th. That's where that deadline came from. Um, it was actually an extra six weeks. We kind of bent the rules a little for Fredonia to get a plan in place of how you were going to move forward to correct all of the deficiencies listed in that report. Um, and that's where we are today. That's why that vote was taken um, to determine which path the village was going to take so that they could then further develop their compliance plan, um, which is constantly changing, um, you know, based on many factors. Uh, engineering is never straightforward, um, but there is a compliance plan that's being worked on to resolve all of the issues in that report. Thank you. As, uh, as a resident of Fredonia, it is, uh, is it possible to have a tour of the reservoir and the spillway, also the dam uh, and the water plant. So, I'm gonna put my mean old regulator hat on here and, and talk about security. Um, one of the reasons that I glossed over security as being a significant concern about the plant and the reservoir is because there are significant concerns for the security at the water plant and the reservoir. It's not that we expect anybody from the village to go up and tamper with the reservoir or the water treatment plant. We realize that is not realistic. However, we are also well aware that social media exists and this stuff gets out and is online and is available to people who do have nefarious intent that could take advantage of that information in ways that could harm the village and their customers. So while village officials have been given those tours so they are well aware of the process issues and the reservoir or the issues at the reservoir there is a reason that the reservoir and the filter treatment building are all marked no trespassing they are to be secured it's all just for context too it's fairly common in other parts of the u.s to not have I call it a no contact order for surface water utilities. Mm -hmm. So like a, a, a reservoir or a lake that's used as a drinking water source, you can't actually, humans are not allowed to touch it. So you're not allowed to recreate in the water um, because of the biological contaminants that might be on your body that could affect the treatment process. Um, the, I, I did my work in Maine and so their treatment processes are very different, but they have, a, they have several lakes in Maine that are no contact orders that you can't touch right, so that you're not affecting their treatment process. So it's not unusual to have, have places that are, have restricted access more broadly just to protect the process of the safety of the, of the water and to not throw any curveballs into an already complex process. Uh, this uh, in, uh, in person wonders why a unredacted engineer's report isn't available or could it be available? I don't know that anyone in, on this panel has an answer for that. Actually, I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> and that dovetails right into what I just said. That engineer's report contains all the vulnerabilities of your water treatment system. If the wrong person got their hands on that report, they would know exactly how to mess with the reservoir, exactly how to mess with your treatment system, exactly how to mess with your distribution system to cause chaos. 
those are the portions of that report that were redacted and they were redacted for the safety of the people that consume Fredonia's water. And they were redacted in collaboration with legal guidance from the village's legal representative, Labella's legal representative, and our legal folks. Everybody teamed up together to put the best interest of the village of Fredonia residents in mind and keep them safe by not airing all of the vulnerabilities of the system. And I realized that, you know, everybody has that, that blue sky attitude of, oh, it would never happen to a plant as small as Fredonia. Literally the day that the vote was taken here in Fredonia to determine which way you were gonna go on the 29th of December, a very small water treatment plant down in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania was hijacked and held for ransom mm. by, you know, cyber terrorists they could not make water for four days before they got control of their systems back. This, this is a request, as was made before, for slides, and we yep, have already that'll be. <laughs> determined that they will be available. Uh, downstream effects of a dam failure, question mark, Canada Way Creek. Any further comments on the uh, consequences of a, of a dam failure? Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, the extent, I'm not an engineer, I'll preface it with that. Um, the extent of the failure would be a significant factor of what kind of uh, damages downstream you'd expect to see. Um, that's a lot of water, like an, an unfathomable amount of water being held back by a very strong structure, right? Um, as far as what would happen, I don't know. But what you do know is that your entire system is fed by gravity outside of the pump at Webster Road that pushes the water back uphill, which means that everyone in Fredonia and all of our buildings are downhill from where the water flows, right? Probably erosion. <laughs> it could be bad. Yeah, I mean, the, the, if you've never seen it, the power of water to do damage is really impressive, um, especially when it's coming up. Even when it's coming up slowly, it can do a lot of damage, and if it's coming at high velocity, it can do it can really take some massive structures out. So you're looking at damage potentially to infrastructure. I don't know the exact specifications, but damage to roads and buildings and businesses, homes. Um, you know, we have a lot of what we call headwater systems around here where they're sort of like the little streams that, that feed in and they're sort of the first receiving um, bodies to catch the waters that's coming off the watershed, including, including um, you know, the reservoir is a headwater system, right? It's sort of like that first pause where the water comes in and, and streams and lakes around here tend to be very flashy. They go up and down. And if you've seen Canada Way Creek when there's been a big uh, rainstorm, you know that that can go very high very quickly. And that's just with a little bit of extra rain over a fairly big area. And so you can imagine that what would happen if you had all of that water coming down at once. I don't know the math comparing that to you know a half inch of rain over several hours, but we know how impressive Canada Way Creek can get because there's no pause, right? There's, it's just coming straight down the hose. Um, and so, it, Presumably, it would top the banks and then be a very large problem for many places. Um, we already have problems down, you know, around the bridges, and we've had things get clogged up down there. I know I have students whose basements have flooded <laughs> after just a heavy rain, um, and so it's it's water can be very very powerful for us. So it's not something you want to um, like. There's a reason why these classifications exist because of potential hazard, right? Uh, this question concerns. Uh, the matter that was raised a moment earlier. Please explain the reasons and methods used to, to redact sections of the report. Um, any, anything you'd like I to add I think we to pretty that? much covered yeah. it. Um, you know, the reason was for security and the methods were things that made either your system or neighboring systems vulnerable because the reports contained a lot of information about Westfield systems and Ripley systems and Dunkirk systems. Um, so that is what was redacted. Thank you. Have village trustees received the redacted sections? Yes, absolutely. I should say reviewed. I say reviewed the redacted sections. Can I put have the mayor answer that question for you? <laughs> well, the question I do want to answer is um, the hospital will have water. Uh, we have, uh, you know, one of the concerns that we have as a group dealing with the hospital is which direction the water is going to come from. I know, uh, Trustee uh, Linden, uh, I believe, Jim, you were, you, we talked about a long time ago that there will be water 
and there will be enough connection for it, whether it's coming from Pomfret, whether it's coming from uh, Dunkirk, or whether it ultimately comes from Fredonia. Um, when it's time to build the hospital, uh, there will be water, uh, bar none. The other question, I apologize, I was out in the, in the front hallway there, was asking about financing. There's probably more financing right now for water infrastructure improvements and replacements uh, than any time I remember. I was incredibly disappointed that we left $375 million on the table around Christmas time that was designed for water infrastructure improvements. And we were the only community in this area that had not applied for that money. There is plenty of uh, projects associated with water that could have been applied for. We're not going to miss those again. Uh, secondly, there's over $372 million in Governor Hochul's budget for this year. And there's, I believe, over $16 billion that the President has set aside specifically for water infrastructure. So there is no reason, no matter which direction the project goes, that we cannot uh, apply and get, for, uh, get the funding that we need uh, for the scope of the project. So as far as what the scope of that project is, um, that number is still outstanding. I believe a little bit of, uh, I think we were low on some estimates myself uh, with regards to the original Labella report. And keep in mind that every day you don't launch a project, the project gets more expensive. So um, there will be funding. There's probably more funding now than ever. And uh, there will be water for the hospital, uh, depending on how soon the hospital gets built and how quickly the various projects surrounding the hospital are completed. I know Pomfret is ready to begin their project this year, and uh, I know there's a connection to Dunkirk going through that area as well. Um, so you shouldn't have to worry about delays in the hospital because of water. Okay. The report, have the board received a copy of the unredacted report? The board's had it copy of the unredacted report and so have the trustees so okay thank, thank you. you this is the final question how was Fredonia able to keep up with uh, keep up when carriage house was operating and the population was higher were there changes beyond lack of investment to keep up to date um, not sure how to answer the second part of that, but the question about um, how the village was able to keep up, um, part of that falls back on the village has a considerable amount of water that is quote unquote unaccounted for. The water that the village makes today, the amount is almost exactly equal to the amount that the village was making when the carriage house was here. And nobody can seem to explain where the vast amount of water that the carriage house used has gone. Um, the village is being very proactive in replacing some old meters in the system, as well as metering some village buildings that didn't already have meters. Um, part of the problem, though, is the age of the water meters at the water treatment plant. And in order to replace those incoming and outgoing meters, um, one, it's a significant cost, um, tens of thousands of dollars to change out an eight or 10 or 12 or 24 inch meter, um, as well as quite frankly, that line that was put in in 1883, the village would have to be crazy to try to change the meter on that line you're more likely to permanently damage that line to the point where it cannot be quickly repaired and put back into service. Um, so we may never know exact, we may never be able to answer that question, exactly why the, meter, the water usage has remained the same with the loss of that large business. Well, thank you, uh, our panelists, uh, and thank you for coming. Uh, I think really we, I will say, we're 
made available, aware of a remarkable amount of information, uh, challenging to be sure, but uh, very, very much needed. So uh, again, my thanks to our panelists, uh, my thanks to you, to the folks of the Opera House, and uh, to the mayor and the others who uh, made this possible. Thanks again.